power lies where men believe it lies. It is a trick, a shadow on the wall. But is that always true? And what happens if it's not true? Welcome to another episode of Just In Time Worlds. Today, I want to discuss a majocracy. That is, a government where majors, plural, rule a nation state. This is distinct from the benevolent wizard ruler or the king who just happens to be a mage. It is also distinct from the overlord in a tower, the sorcerer who rules the land with an iron fist. A majocracy is a government that is based on the power of mages. In this kind of system, every ruler, every noble, every titled person in the government has their own magical power. And this is not a power that is solely granted to them by the legitimacy of their government. It's not just a shadow on the wall. It is a real, direct, translatable power. They could incinerate you with a fireball. They could throw a lightning bolt at you. Whatever their magical ability is, that is the real, direct power they can influence. What does a majocracy give you as a world builder that you can't get from another form of government? The first most awesome thing about a majocracy is that it gives you the ability to get the big guns of your world involved in conflict without it seeming weird. In a normal government, it is strange to see a ruler directly take the battlefield all the time. Why would the king come out? He'd send his generals or his barons or his lords and only get involved if the fighting is really serious. But in a majocracy, the legitimacy of the government is based on the magical prowess of the rulers. And because of that, the rulers need to show off that prowess. They can't just sit back and relax and wait for the army to deal with the problem. Because that's not why people believe in their leadership. People believe in their leadership because they are majors. Therefore, they have to show off their magical abilities to the population. What this allows you to do as a storyteller is get away from the farm boy trope. Not every hero has to be a farm boy to make sense. You can have nobles be the protagonists in your story in a way that makes sense. Why would the noble leave the court behind and go take care of the problem personally with only a few retainers? Because it shows off his power. It reinforces the legitimacy of his governance. Basically, maintenance of power in a majocracy requires an almost gang-like mentality, like a gang leader. You don't take care of every problem yourself. But if you don't take care of some problems yourself, people lose faith in you. And that is when rebellions breed. Of course, a majocracy doesn't all have to be iron-fisted control. You can show off your magic by doing nice things to the people who don't have magic. So you can bring healing to the population. You can make sure the harvest is good, control of the weather, all of those kinds of abilities, which makes the peasants love you, which is always good for a ruler. But it also allows you to demonstrate, again, your magical abilities which is what your form of government is based on. Bringing healing to the land or to the people actually reinforces the legitimacy of your government. There are some downsides to a majocracy. Sometimes because magic is so important in this kind of system, your intrigue and consensus-based politics, the kind of rough and tumble give and take of politicians negotiating with each other can become neglected in favor of my magic is bigger than your magic, so I get my way and you get nothing. And that feels very false in a government. Not only does it feel false, but there is no room for negotiation and therefore very little room for storytelling in such a system. So ideally what you want is you want some kind of reign on power or you want a number of majors who are all almost equal in power 
so that they can act as a limiting factor on each other and force some kind of compromise in the government. The other big downside of a majocracy is quite often the normal population, the peasant population, have no magic. And if that is the case, it can often feel as though that population is left behind. It can feel as though they have no hope of impacting their nobles. A good way to get around this is by implementing limits on your magic, especially limits that exhaust the mage. Because what this allows you to do is if your peasant population is pushed too far, they can rise up. And if they rise up in great enough numbers, they will threaten the mages because the mages will get tired before the peasants run out of bodies. Of course, they have to be pushed very hard to reach this point because you are then accepting as a peasant that you're probably going to lose your life in this drive towards freedom. So if you want to make sure that your peasants do have some kind of recourse, put some limiting factors on your magic, and of course you should always limit your magic, where the peasants can overcome the mages by sheer force of numbers. So let's talk about some examples from fantasy that use a majocracy. One of the best known examples is surely Brandon Sanderson's Mistborn, where the ruler gave all of the nobles mistborn talents. What this meant is that they could use the magic called allomancy, where they ingest certain metals, and then based on those metals, they can manifest certain powers. Now, over time, this magic has decreased in the mistborn bloodlines to the point where they no longer have multiple talents. They have maybe one, and they're called mistings. And that kind of slow degeneration of power is a very interesting thing in any majocracy. If the legitimacy of your government is based on magical power, what happens if that power starts to decrease? What happens if a noble is born without any magic? Do they become a non-noble? This is what happens in the Dark Sword trilogy by Margaret Vase and Tracy Hickman, where the king's son is born without magic and as such can't be a noble. In Sanderson's uh, Mistborn trilogy, there is a non-noble who is born with magical abilities. What happens in that case? Does this person become a noble? These are very interesting questions that make for great conflict in your stories. It is a fascinating story to tell from the perspective of somebody born to a bloodline but with no magic, like in the Dark Sword trilogy, or the inverse, somebody born with magic but no bloodline, as in the Mistborn trilogy. I have this kind of system in the Empire of Lumiaron, which is the setting in my world for my first book, The Hidden Blade. Links down below if you want to purchase it. If a noble child is incapable of learning hobby, they are repudiated by their bloodline and they no longer carry the name. So both in Mistborn and in my world, the model is that nobles have magic and normal people don't. But there is another model and that is where everyone has magic, even if it's small. But the most powerful magicians are the rulers. And this is how Jim Butcher's Codex Alera works. So in Codex Alera, everybody binds with furies, and these furies allow them to manifest magic. However, to become a citizen, you have to bind with multiple furies, and citizenship then comes with additional rights and obligations. So in Codex Alera, Butcher tells the story of the guy who can't bind with a fury and therefore is very weird in his society and how he overcomes this and deals with this difficulty. It's a really fun series from Jim Butcher, and I do recommend checking it out, especially if you like his writing style. So if you're building a majocracy, consider, does everyone have magic or is it just the nobles who have magic? If everyone has magic, how is it decided who the ruler is? Is it based on power? Is it based on knowledge? Are there tests for it? If the system is that only the nobles have power, what happens if a child is born that has magic but is not of a noble bloodline? 
Conversely, what happens if a child is born that has a noble bloodline but has no magic? And lastly, how do your mages show off their power? Remember, they have to prove that they are entitled to these positions by demonstrating their magical power. The whole legitimacy of the government is based off this. So how do your mages show off the power? Do they bring healing to the population? Do they have magical duels? What I do in The Hidden Blade is I have a sport that has a magical component to it that shows off the magic of the combatants in the sport. And you can check out my video on how to design a sport for a fantasy world linked in the card. So you need to give your mages the opportunity to show off their magic so that they can continually reinforce why they should be in power. And that is how you build a majocracy and the benefits that you get from it. I hope that you enjoyed this video. Please do give it a thumbs up. It really does help with the algorithm. And you can support me on Ko-fi or check out my book. And I will see you soon for another episode of Just In Time Worlds.